Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, February 13th, and this is the weekly market update. So in this week's reality check, I put a visual up here and it's I find it interesting. This does a couple things for me. It um, shows the total market cap of Tesla now is now equal to the entire S&P 500 oil sector. So the value of Tesla is now equal to all of the oil sector in the S&P 500. That's all of the energy producers, the oil and gas service stocks, the whole shebang. First of all, ask yourself the question. If you had to make, if I gave you unlimited amount of money and you had to make one choice and one investment for the next five to 10 years, would you buy Tesla or would you buy the entire S&P oil sector? And ask yourself why. I mean, you have, in my mind, a sector, the oil and gas sector, which is completely out of favor. It's being demonized yet it's a necessary uh, product for what for civilization. I find it amusing. I mean, I live in South Texas, right by the Mexican border in, in, in Harlingen, Texas, by Brownsville. It's going to be 25 degrees here over the next couple of days. That's unheard of down here. I mean, I have to take all kinds of wild precautions because it doesn't get that cold here. And obviously that's nothing compared to what's going on in the rest of the country where it's extremely below zero. I mean, people are literally going to freeze to death in some areas. We're going to, it's not funny, you know, you know uh, from that perspective. What's amusing to me is the demonization of oil and gas, which allows people in most of the rest of the country to survive. If you're a true believer in CO2 climate change, turn your furnace off during this time. You know, that's what I find amusing. So, Personally, if you gave me the choice, I could either have Tesla, the entire Tesla corporation, all the stock at its current price, or I could have the entire S&P 500 oil sector, I'd take the oil sector. It makes money. It's beaten down. It's going to come back. Here's another, you know, Tesla is a manifestation, I think, of several things, right? The unbridled money printing and government, the physical, fiscal and monetary malfeasance of the Federal Reserve and government, uh, the bubblicious conditions caused by uh, the mispricing of money by the Federal Reserve, holding interest rates down, the idea that uh, an energy transition, which is being mandated in the West, is going to happen in the next couple of years when any, every other energy transition has taken decades all of these things I find, um, these are wrong. Th this is wrong thinking and wrong thinking is being priced right now. And I'll take the other side of that bet. Now this, you know, like I said, if you're a true believer, turn your furnace off. The ability to sit there and demonize an industry, especially in like Canada, or even what we're seeing with the new administration, an industry that's allowing tens of millions of people to survive. I mean, you would die in some of these conditions without heat. It's just that simple. Places around the Northern Hemisphere are uninhabitable without fossil fuels. And to think that this is going to be con converted all to electrical, um, I'm already seeing reports. I was reading news reports down here. I mean, ERCOT, which is our grid manager here in Texas, uh, Texas is not really connected to the other ISOs. Well, there are some small connections here and there, but basically Texas is its own entity as far as its grid management and ERCOT is the entity that manages that uh, has already stated that the grid is going to be put under tremendous strain during this cold snap because why? Large portions of the state do not get their heat from gas or oil. They get it from electric heating. I mean, I have uh, central AC here and I have a heater in it, but it ver I mean, it maybe gets used once or twice a year uh, gets a little chilly. Now we're going to be into, you got to run it or the pipes are going to freeze in the house. This is, you know, the pipes run through the attic in Texas and my attic has, you know, louvers on each side for airflow. So 
we have to take all kinds of precautions here because this is so out of the ordinary. And I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent and piss more people off, but I guess I'll go ahead and do it anyways. You know, this is kind of what I've been talking about. This is going to be the biggest FU in the history of the world. Uh, the biggest contrarian move. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say weather, but it's starting to line up. Like I said, guys, I've been talking about this for three or four years. You know, the sunspot cycles have gotten decreased intensity. This is the third cycle in a row. And, you know, historically, when this has happened, we've had colder temperatures. And I've actually seen reports, if you can believe this, I mean, these people are insufferable, these climate nuts. Um, the reason why we have cold is because the Arctic is warmer now because that's being caused by climate change. I wish somebody would define their words. Of course, the climate changes. It's going to get colder over time. That's my thesis. The climate gets warmer, it gets colder. You know, I mean, CO2 has a negligible, in my view, I'm, I'm not going to get into this argument. The facts are what they are. If you really believe this, turn your furnace off, but they're not going to. They'll die. You'll die if you turn it off, if it's 30 below zero outside. I mean, or you'll be sitting under blankets piled up eight feet high. So, yeah, I think this getting back to the investment implications without going on too much of a rant. If you had your choice, ask yourself that question. I'd like to hear about it in the comments. Would you rather own Tesla? If you could own Tesla or the entire S&P oil and gas sector, that's all you could own for the next 10 years. Which one would you pick? I'd pick the oil and gas sector because uh, I think that, you know, although we're going to mandate an energy transition in the West, the government's going to mandate it. It's just that simple. That's only 800 million people. We pointed that out before in the developed countries. The rest of the six, seven billion people uh, that are in emerging markets, that are in frontier markets, um, they will require fossil fuels. Not only that, fossil fuels are going to be necessary for the energy transition to re rebuildables in the West. You're not, you know, the, the solar farm can't replicate itself. It doesn't produce enough energy. The energy input is, and the return on the energy that's input is not sufficient to rebuild itself. So um, these are things that are going to have to be learned. And like I said, it fits well into uh, the heads we win, tails we win more. So we're going to get them coming and going on this. So I wanted to point this out because it's instructive of a couple things. The bubblicious market that we're in and the monetary malfeasance, but also just investor psychology and sentiment. And these things are very important. Sediment and psychology are very important as being successful in speculating and investing. They are almost more important than anything else in my view. So this is a headline from last week in the Houston Chronicle. I just like to point these things out. I like to point out contrarian indicators that from the media. The media is always lagging. They don't have any critical thinking. They just parrot whatever they're told so you know the new zeitgeist is is that fossil fuels are going to go away and this is the reason why i think this is uh amusing or why it's important to put up here is because houston is acknowledged as being basically the energy capital of the united states if not the world i mean major corporations of all types of energy companies are based there uh, if you ever have been there and you go to the Galveston, Deer Park, Pasadena area, there's a whole, there's called the Houston Ship Channel. It's just lined with chemical plants and refineries and all kinds of petrochemical installations. So um, I thought this was interesting that the hometown paper of the energy capital in the world is proclaiming on the front page of its, that the end of fossil fuels dominance is in sight. Well, that, again, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's correct, but we'll see. So there's been a lot of talk recently in the that I've seen um, about a commodity super cycle. And um, just as a side note, uh, I did an interview, which I'll post later this next week, probably Wednesday or so, with a person called uh, named uh, Peter Sainsbury. He basically writes the materials risk website. He's a commodity and resource uh, guy. He, I really find his um, articles and uh, I'm on his email list. He sends out a lot of free information. 
Uh, he's written a couple books on commodities, but he talked about recently about a commodity super cycle, the drivers of it gets in more depth than you just see in the headlines. Like, you know, Goldman Sachs calls for new super cycle. Okay. Well, that's interesting. But what does that really mean? Right. So, um, We'll have that interview coming up next week, which I think you'll find interesting. And I'll put a link to Peter's website uh, and his Twitter feed. And I suggest that you uh, take a look at it. You can sign up for his, uh, get on his email list. He sends out, I think, a couple times a week an email that, I mean, just about every piece of work that he sent to me has been useful to me as far as uh, regards to commodities. But anyways... This is from Gold uh, J.P. Morgan. Um, they were talking about uh, the new super cycle in commodities. Uh, I don't disagree with this, but uh, some of the drivers we've talked about and some of what we had, but I thought it'd be instructive to go through this and kind of talk about some of these um, potential drivers of the new com commodity super cycle. End of pandemic and reopening of economies. Yes, that's one of the things that we've picked up on. Uptick in global economic growth, roaring 20s. It's interesting to note that I've seen several comparisons to the economy recovering after the 1918 Spanish flu. That was like a two-year deal with that flu, which was tremendously worse in killing people than this deal has been. But, uh, you know, people were, I'm not saying they were locked down, but there was a tremendous amount of uh, pent-up demand and spending. And uh, a lot of people attribute the roaring 20s uh, decade to the, you know, two years uh, pent up demand and the recovery, you know, one of the theses that I had heard over the last week or two on a couple podcasts was that, you know, people have been locked down, you know, we're social animals, we want to get out there, we want to go on vacation, we want to go out to eat, we want to go to clubs, we want to go to bars, bowling alleys, whatever, and we want to mix with other humans. And, uh, you know, with all the pent up demand and cash, that's uh, been uh, showered on everyone from the government uh, in, in inability of people to actually go out and spend uh, that there's, you know, we're going to get this big burst of activity. So that'd be interesting to see uh, end of trade war and manufacturing recession. Um, I guess that's the, uh, if you look at the PMIs around the world, they're all in most of the manufacturing areas are above 50, which signals expansion. I follow those uh, quite diligently in China, Brazil, the United States, Europe. Uh, but we are seeing uh, in most of the major areas expansion in manufacturing. Um, ultra loose monetary policies across the world. I've been talking about this even before the pandemic. This was uh, the situation. Uh, where we showed that the uh, you know Council for Foreign Relations has an excellent tool for this to track the monetary looseness around the world. Uh, it gives a good, um, there's also a website that just goes over central bank, reports central banks from around the world, what they're doing, loosening, tightening. But the CFR one I like, because it has like um, plus 10 and minus 10. And so plus 10 would be maximum amount of tightening, Minus 10 would be the maximum amount of loose loose policy. And uh, last time I looked at it, it was like at, it's been down at the maximum amount of uh, monetary uh, loose uh, conditions uh, for many, many years. So, yes, that's a major tailwind uh, to the commodity super cycle. Increased and tolerated inflation. Yes, uh, we've had the Federal Reserve, at least in the U.S., say that uh, they want inflation, right? And we've talked about it on this channel. We think that here that um, that's going to be the condition. One of the things they need to do to deal with the total amount of debt that the federal government has, it's just out of control. And with the impending doom, doomsday clock of baby boomers retiring and taking Social Security and Medicare benefits, things are just going to get worse. So, you know, this is where we start getting in talking about yield curve control, uh, we talk about letting inflation run above the rate of interest for a substantial amount of time, but that, ba that devalues the value of the debt and makes it easier, basically steals from savers and gives to debtors, de biggest debtor being the government. And uh, we, we, we see that, I mean, all of these policies are going to lead to a weak, weakening U.S. dollar. Uh, there is that idea, you know, of this 
dollar will get stronger in the short term. But I think everybody agrees that over the longer term, I'm talking about a decade out, the dollar has no choice but to go lower. I mean, the Rubicon has been crossed of the Brendel fly joining of fiscal and monetary authorities in the US at least, I believe uh, tr President Trump was the first modern monetary president uh, who you know had those huge tax cuts that were not financed and ran the first, you know, basically put us on the track to having locked in trillion dollar a year deficits. And now with this new administration, you have Janet Yellen at the Treasury, who's made several statements about, um, you know, they're going to fix the world's ills with, uh, that's, that's her role there at the Treasury. Well, I mean, that means issuing more debt and having the, having the Fed um, buy it. Now, I thought I heard an interesting uh, idea this week on a podcast um, on Macro Voices. Yeah, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but, you know, I think there's still a tendency at the Fed to want to have the perception that they are an independent entity and they're not, you know, they've, we've been here before is what the argument was. We've been here before during the Great Society and the Vietnam War. We were here before after World War II. And, you know, the monetary authorities try to maintain this facade or this um, uh, view outside from the view from the outside that they are independent, that they're not influenced by politics. But I just don't think that that's uh, going to hold, and uh, they will uh, succumb to the political needs of the parties that are in power because both the parties, traditional parties, are not adverse to spending money. That's what they do, and uh, with the problems that we have, uh, they're going to have to try to solve this uh, with increased inflation and uh, subduing interest rates. Um, so fiscal measures with infrastructure, that's already been said, is going to happen. That's not just in the U.S., uh, that's in the EU. Uh, infrastructure spending continues to grow in the emerging markets and frontier markets. Uh, that's going to continue. So expect that to happen. Uh, financial inflows to hedge inflation, bond equity correlation. Yes, as bond prices rise or initially, um, I think you will see uh, you know, the bond market is not going to be a place to be when real interest rates are negative. Uh, people will understand that uh, investors uh, are not stupid. And money will flow out of the bond market, which is probably the biggest the government US Treasury market is probably the biggest bubble in the history of mankind. And I suspect that individual investors and institutional investors will move out of there, at least until they're, you know, they're mandated to buy a certain amount of treasuries, that's always a possibility. And then uh, they'll be migrating into the equity markets and into the commodity markets. Uh, financial inflows to follow asset momentum, of course, once you get something moving in the direction, the Momo crowd comes in. We've seen what that can do. Uh, we've seen that when, you know, this new emergence of this horde, if you will, of small investors that are uh, kind of created their own communities on the internet, Discord, and Reddit, and they're, cha they're exchanging information and they flow like these great herds of wildebeest or zebras or gazelles on, on the Serengeti plain and they just change direction. Uh, and the tremendous amount of power that they wield now, uh, yes, uh, some of these markets in these resource slash commodity markets are so small that that kind of attention given to them and that kind of money flow uh, will result in uh, or could result in huge, huge moves to the upside, more than you would have seen in the past, in my view. So that'll be interesting. Obviously, ESG, metals for new infrastructure, EVs, batteries, we've talked about that before. Heads I win, tails I win more. Uh, ESG, again, erosion of capital production, capacity for oil. Yes, that's you know that's the new tobacco, if you will, uh, or coal, any kind of hydrocarbon-based energy, uh, yet it will still be in demand, but the supply is being constricted, slowly being squeezed. So that's good for the uh, price over time as supply is constricted. Um, and then inefficiencies, instabilities of wind and solar. Yes, I mean, this is not being acknowledged, right? Uh, if one is actually wanting to lower the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, 
and wants to move to an electrification of the grid, um, my view would be the best way to do that is with nuclear power. Uh, you have to be an advocate for nuclear power if you are a advocate for man-made climate change and electrification of the transportation infrastructure. It's just that simple. Um, you simply aren't going to be able, I mean, this is obvious right now. I mean, uh, you can look in these certain areas, like they're talking about in certain parts of the country, you can't build any more homes after a certain point with natural gas. Well, how do you heat it with electric heat? What people don't seem to understand is you can put up all the solar and wind. We've talked about that before, about the capacity factors and the inability for them to be on demand sources of energy. What has not been talked about, and I did talk about with the um, professor of engineering from Cambridge in one of the previous interviews I did was your neighborhood is not, your neighborhood distribution system for electricity is not engineer sized for full conversion to electricity for everything. You know, when they build out the infrastructure for your subdivision, they assume a certain amount of uh, average demand per household and they size the lines for that. They size the transformers for that. And so if everybody shut off their natural gas and relied on heat in their uh, electric heat or relied on everybody got a Tesla, the infrastructure, the transformers, the lines are not engineered for that. That all has to be, re that all has to be upgraded. And so um, this is going to require a tremendous amount of investment, a tremendous amount of commodity demand. It's, it's something that's not talked about in any of this, or if it is, it's just done with a wave of the hand. And uh, that to my mind is even more critical than just putting up these, the uh, wind turbines or the solar farms. I mean, you've got to be able to get the power to the consumer. And if the grid's not sized for that, that has the grid has to be completely replaced. And so how do you do that? And who pays for that? Um, sediment. So this is Google Trends. This is something I use. Anybody can go there. It's free. You can put search terms in the search window here for whatever you'd like to put in here. You know, you can put GameStop in here. You can put, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian in here, whatever you want to put in here. But, you know, I put the search term, this is based on Google's, I mean, it comes up immediately. So this is like commodity super cycle. Okay. So this goes back to uh, basically last year and to the current time. And so let me explain this. So 100, it goes from a scale here from zero to 100. 100 meaning, you know, maximum amount of everybody talking about it, uh, maximum exposure top, you know what I mean? Zero means they don't even have enough data to even give you a reading. So this thing, no one's taught, no one cares. I mean, there was a short spike here, like at the end of the last year, when some people were talking about it in their end of year and upcoming 2021, it spiked a little bit of interest for like two weeks and then it's back down to zero. And I mean, zero doesn't mean no one's talking about it. It just means there's not enough data, insufficient data to give a reading, which means that hardly anybody's talking about it. So we'd want to see this thing, you know, moving like this over time consistently and then peeking out you can go back and like search like bitcoin during um the top at uh uh when it topped out the first time when retail got annihilated several years ago a matter of fact i made a video uh talking about that that was one of my first videos the video is horrible by the way uh the technology i was using i don't even remember it was a terrible video but anyways i did i think i believe i showed this as being one of the sediment indicators i used to understand that you know when everybody's in no one else can get is going to get in there's no new money and that's what we were then so that's this is just this is not the end all be all you know the same thing i talk about magazine covers or like i showed you the houston chronicle front page talking about uh you know uh the end of uh oils in sight uh, you know based in the hometown paper of the energy capital of the world uh, these are contrarian indicators to me so i use these sediment in indicators to let me know if, if a market that I'm in is under, undervalued, overvalued, you know, if there's too many people on one side of the boat, you know, the sediment is very important, as I said before. And right now, no one cares about commodity super cycle. They're not hardly even talking about it, which means that it's in the early innings. And 
the train is, you know, not left the station yet, even though prices are up off the bottom for many commodity stocks. You know, many of the stocks that we're talking about uh, in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter, some of them are up, you know, over 100%. And I think we've got one or two that are up over a couple hundred percent. So um, I guess something to say on that is I'm looking to put new money in the market into these stocks. And I've been holding off because the runs on some of these stocks have been so tremendous. And I don't like putting money in after a big run. I mean, they're really extended on the charts and I'm looking for a pullback. Uh, so I've had a hard time putting new money to work. And uh, I did have one stock in the portfolio that hasn't moved too much. It's a um, company that does offshore seismic uh, work for offshore drillers. It's been up, but not that much. So I, I took a, a bigger position in that. Um, I'm going to give you a freebie. Here's one for you. I don't like to give the newsletter picks out because those are mostly small and mid-cap stocks that have the uh, possibility of really being five and 10 baggers. But I will give you a large cap stock that has uh, not really performed that well that I think has tremendous opportunity. And I do own some shares in it. And it's the big oil sands operator in Canada, Suncor. Um, at $60 a barrel, they are going to be very cash flow positive. And the stock really hasn't moved. Why? Uh, the indications are that the Saudis sold off a major share of their stock in the last couple of weeks, 20 million shares or so that had the, that had the effect of kind of holding back the share price. Uh, that overhead is now out and been sold and uh, digested. So, you know, that's a stock that could easily go. It's, I think it's around 17 or 18 bucks a share right now. That's a stock that, uh, you know, at $70 oil is probably a $40, $45 stock. So, you know, that's, that's a freebie. But, you know, small caps and mid caps that have tremendous leverage to the oil price. Uh, you know, I talked about one uh, a couple of weeks ago, Athabasca Oil. It's already up tremendously. Uh, that's, you know, I, would I buy it right now? No, because it's had a tremendous run. If oil goes to 75 or 80 that thing is a cash flow machine. At 40, it doesn't make any money and it's at risk. At, that's, how, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Some of these companies have tremendous leverage and gearing to a higher oil price. So it takes a little bit of research, but I don't think you can go wrong with a stock like Suncor if you have not done anything with the uh, oil and gas. And again, I'm still a big fan of the uh, like Russia ETF. Uh, it's very energy intensive with the Russian oil producers. They're very, very profitable and cash flowing at these prices. Tremendously cheap. Russia is, you know, always is and has been the, the uh, you know, cartoonish enemy of the, of the deep state. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've just been divesting themselves of the West, uh, got rid of their treasury and dollar holdings, have tremendous amounts of gold. And if we are entering a commodity super cycle, it's perfectly set up and geared for that. Uh, so I, I would expect that to perform over time. So I wanted to point this out, uh, Royal Dutch Shell. There was an article in Bloomberg. They, uh, they said that they will see a 1% to 2% annual decline in their oil production. Uh, here's some snippets from the article. And a sign of how much the petroleum industry has shifted away from its mantra of growth and exploration Shell said its oil production will fall by 1% to 2% a year. Article goes on to say, in a wide-ranging strategy update published on Thursday, which I, by the way, have not looked at. I'll probably take a look at it. The Anglo-Dutch company set new targets for electric car charging, carbon capture and storage, and electricity sales. It also sought to reassure investors that it could maintain returns through the energy transition, reiterating its pledge for an annual dividend increase of about 4%, and the resumption of share buybacks once its net debt target had been achieved. I'm not sure about that. Uh, we'll have to see, but um, these companies are basically starting from ground zero and there's companies that are have nothing but their focus on these particular other industries around renewables. I've worked for many of them. They're tremendously have head starts. They've been bid up in price, as a matter of fact. Um, one of the companies in the portfolio that I hold is a uh, geothermal and run of river 
producer of electricity in Central and South America, and they've been bid up tremendously. It's basically just kind of a utility type situation. They have fixed PPAs that they get uh, nice prices on that get are fixed to uh, uh, fixed cost increases based on inflation, and they just churn out ca- it just churns out cash, but it's basically doubled since I've owned it, and um, that's because everything green is green. So uh, I don't know if these guys are going to build these things from scratch. I mean, there's a limited amount of people that know how to do these things, build solar and wind. Believe me, I know I work in the business. There's not that many people as you think that uh, over time you can train them and they'll be churned out of uh, technical schools and get experience. But you know, you're not going to do this in a year or two. There's just not that many people that know how to build wind farms and solar farms. Well, at least correctly. Believe me, there's plenty of people that don't know what they're doing out there trying to do these things. Uh, this is Ian London. He's the CEO of Lundin Petroleum. Adolf Lundin was his father. These people are uh, based in Sweden. I follow this family, they have created tremendous amounts of shareholder wealth uh, with the companies that they have built and brought public. Um, I wanted to point this out because this kind of segues into why I had Peter Sainsbury on my, um, as an interview for the interview series, because he had a recent article also about the commodity super cycle S curve super cycle that India's getting ready to transition to, which will be similar to what China went through, you know, through its uh, urbanization and industrialization. China uh, obviously is a command co- economy with the people's uh, PRC running things um, or the uh, Chinese Communist Party, I mean, running things. And, you know, India is a democracy, a very wild one. So it's things aren't going to happen as quickly in China because it's not a command economy. But I like what uh, Ian Lundin said here, IEA, which is an international energy uh, agency, says India will be the largest source of energy and demand growth over the next two decades. India's oil demand is expected to rise to 8.7 million barrels per day in 2040, up from 5 million barrels per day in 2019. India currently imports about 70%, 76% of its crude oil needs, but that is expected to rise to 90% by 2030. So yes, the age of petroleum and energy transition is happening in the West, but that's not necessarily the case in the rest of the world. And that's where I think the opportunity is. Um, You need a tremendous amount of energy to urbanize your population. I still, I think if I remember correctly, India is about, has about 40 or 50% of its population still lives in agrarian villages and towns. Um, to get to the urbanization and bringing up the infrastructure and the standard of living is going to require a tremendous amount of energy. And that's why you're going to see oil demand basically, you know, go up by about 70% over the next, you know, 10 years. So, or 20 years. So that just won't be oil. That'll be gas. That will be nuclear power, electricity, the whole shebang and everything that goes along with that. And you know, then don't forget about like all of Africa with billion people that live, you know, billion plus people that live there and the, you know, they're even further behind in India. So yes, uh, tremendous opportunity awaits us over the next 10 to 20 years in the resource markets. I uh, wanted to point this out, uh, some great reads that came out this week. I will put links to them in the show notes. Um, Nine Point Partners, that's Eric Nuttle, our uh, guy that we follow in Canada, the last of the Energy Fund Mohicans. Uh, He was recently on BNN, but they had Nine Point Partners puts out a commentary, um, their oil fund playbook, if you will. And he has like four steps he goes over there. Step one, inventory surplus normalization, which we've talked about is happening. Step two, OPEC spare capacity exhaustion, something that people aren't talking about. Uh, People just think, well, if the oil price goes up, all this spare capacity will come online. And that's true to a certain extent, but there's been no investment in OPEC uh, increasing their production capabilities either. And once you, you know, you return the demand returns and you exhaust the um, spare capacity, then what? 
Uh, step three, we enter a post shale world in 2022. We do know that uh, a lot of the shale producers have said that they are going to concentrate on living inside their cash flow for growth. 70% uh, of the cash flow to go to be recycled into new drilling, the remi remaining 30% into paying down debt and returns to shareholders. But we'll see if that mentality changes as the oil price continues to climb. I would note that recent reports around drilling activity indicate that um, with current oil prices climbing as they are, rigs are going back to work. So we'll have to watch that to see, you know, I always want to watch what people do, not what they actually say, because people will say anything and they'll do the exact opposite. We know that. So, um, and then step four, the re-rate, which is once people realize what's happening and that the price rise is not transitory, that it is going to stick, that you'll see the equities re-rate higher. And they were beaten down so far that yes, a lot of them have moved off the bottom tremendously. We've got, you know, stocks up over 100% on some of these companies, uh, but uh, expect that to move higher over time because the cash flow walls are going to be tremendous hitting some of these companies. Um, so yes, that's something to look forward to. Uh, another folks that we follow that we find tremendous value in their writing, Goring and Rosenzweig's Q4 2020 Natural Resources Market Commentary. Tremendous. I'll put a link to it. Uh, uh, you should be reading this. Uh, it really gives you a good, good overview of what's going on in the various resource markets. And these guys are tremendous in their research. They've been spot on. Uh, the theme for this uh, particular report, if you will, or commentary is uh, ignoring energy transition reality. So this whole discussion around the energy transition, I think is going to be a lot longer and more difficult than people are thinking, which is going to lead to mispricings, which we can take advantage of as speculators. Okay, wow, that's uh, a lot of information to digest this week. Um, like I said, I will put links to this information in the show notes. I also would like to uh, plug the newsletter, Actionable Intelligence Alert Newsletter. 150 bucks a year, you get 12 issues, you get access to the back issues. People ask me, what do I get? What's in this? Well, it's about uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 words. Um, I basically do a portfolio review, any kind of news for the portfolio companies that I think is relevant. I add to that. I give commentary where necessary, if it's positive or negative. Um, I give a regular market commentary, usually on some subject or theme relevant to uh, what we're investing in. And uh, then if, uh, if there's a new addition to the portfolio, which is not every month, sometimes I, we find something good and sometimes we don't. Uh, if we have a new addition, there'll be a write up in there. And like I said, you have access to the back issues, uh, which I have posted on my website, it's password protected. So that's what you get, right? And, uh, you know, people have uh, found some value in it recently because of, uh, you know, a lot of our thesis around a resource recovery and resource markets and commodities is happening. And so quite a few of the companies in the portfolio are doing tremendous. We've got some laggards. Yes, I'm still bullish on tankers longer term got some laggards around there, but uh, we've got some top performers in it. We've got some doubles, triples in there. So um, yeah, and uh, we're only in the initial innings of this thing. So consider that. Uh, but regardless, uh, I think, you know, we're going to continue to bring more interviews to you. This is what people seem to like. Uh, I will continue making these videos on a weekly basis, and uh, I will be trying to put more information on the actual actionable intelligence alert website. Uh, you can sign up there. I send out an email once a week that usually has something relevant uh, and something uh, good information in that. So a tremendous amount of content. Uh, so uh, happy to listen to suggestions or, you know, listen to ways to tweak this to make it better. But uh, definitely appreciate the support of the listeners. Um, I would ask for the podcast listeners out there, if you would, um, whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on, if they have the ability to rank us or comment or like, I ask that you do that. Take the time to do that because it does help us out. 
it does uh, raise us in the rankings and gets us uh, in front of more people, which is the goal that we're trying to do here. So raise awareness and uh, get our word out there. So that's it for this week, guys. Appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next week.